that uh, uh, that takes place uh, twice uh, twice a month. Um, and today we have the great uh, the great pleasure of uh, of uh, uh, having with us Nilesh Bose, who um, will be talking about a new edited volume who, who has come with uh, 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 Bloomsbury. Um, so um, Nilesh Bose is a um, uh, is a, a researcher on various on various uh, uh, field of inquiry ranging from British Empire, the colonization, history of migra migration. He has keen interest in theater, performance studies, and and uh, uh, popular culture. Um, he's he's currently um, a Canada Research Chair uh, in Global and Comparative History at the University of Victoria uh, at British Columbia. Um, he's also associate professor at the Department of History uh, in the same university. Um, he was previously at St. John University and also in, in uh, at the University of North Texas. Um, and he has been uh, author of, uh, of several books. Two of them uh, he's working on uh, at the moment. Um, and um, and today he um, he will be he will be presenting uh, some of the findings of this new volume, South Asian migration, global history, historical markers, and new uh, directions. The, the 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 book focuses on various type of migration since the the 1830s um, from from India to. Uh, Fiji, Mexico, South Africa, North, North America, Middle East, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, exploring various forms of labor from uh, indentured labor to modern form of, uh, uh, of work. Um, so uh, without further, uh, uh, further delay, I am more than happy to leave the floor to, to, to Nilesh Bose for his, uh, for his presentation. Um, the presentation are usually around uh, uh, around uh, 45 minutes, a bit, a bit less, a bit uh, more, and then we'll we'll have a round of questions from the from the floor and from the audience. Uh, so please, uh, everyone, stay with us for for the for the discussion session. Uh, 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 this is, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martelli. Uh, thank you to Dr. Shorkar. Thank you to Nir Gohar and to everybody who has logged in today. I hope uh, everybody can hear me. So if anybody cannot hear me, please um, let me know uh, in the chat. And I'm going to share my screen uh, right now. And I am hoping uh, that this is uh, visible uh, to everybody. Is, is it? Uh, yeah, all, all okay, good, good. good. Fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, so. Uh, it is Sunday evening here in uh, Victoria in Western Canada, uh, about 10.30 uh, p.m., but this is a common practice in the era of um, Zoom uh, conferencing and presentation. Very happy to join uh, uh, in the morning time in India. India, as uh, many of you know, is the source, uh, as of the last count, of the largest numbers of migrants who are tracked by various nation states throughout the world. By uh, the last count in 2017, uh, 30 million migrants who count their homes as India, the largest source of remittance uh, annually, and of the top five Asian corridor countries of migrants. And today I will discuss uh, the history and importance of various approaches to studying the history of migrants from South Asia, and in particular, how state level processes shape uh, migration uh, historically and through uh, briefly to the present. And I'll end with a note on the legal history of immigration legislation from India. And I'll do so from the context of uh, the field of South Asian migrations in a global historical context, as the title of my recently published edited volume shows here on the right. Um, today, I will offer a, a, a preview of what this book um, uh, contains, and I will suggest that a legal history shows a continu continuity of certain aspects of the colonial era of indentured labor regulation, and that specific laws were passed uh, 
when indentured labor began formally in the 1830s and ended uh, nominally officially in the 1920s, those are relevant for understanding how migration uh, from India is regulated and managed in the present day. The topic of South Asian migration in history brings to light many different time periods, many different types of migration. And so it is impossible to cover all of them in one uh, presentation. But I today will focus on the modern period in this context periodized from the 1830s, which I will talk about, and about how states uh, regulate the movement of people um, outside of India. And this would be a framework to offer in order to understand the history of South Asian migrations in global um, contexts. So the modern experiences of migration of people from South Asia in this context begins from the 1830s, decade in which uh, the British Empire in uh, India, at that time East India Company, began to abolish the transatlantic slave system and replace that system with an indentured labor system, sending indentured laborers culled initially from what is now Chennai and Kolkata to various places in the world, um, including points in Southern Africa, uh, places in the Caribbean, including Guyana and Trinidad, places in the Pacific, including Fiji and various other uh, nodes in South America. And this system lasts through uh, the 1920s, in particular 1922, is a law that I will speak of that ended this system. The indentured labor system uh, was designed in 1837 formally to help the British imperial economic system and planters to uh, work with a legal instrument to structure labor markets. And this ensured large scale systematic state sponsored migration from India, uh, primarily to fulfill the needs of planters and the colonial labor policy was driven by the need to provide abundant, diversified, and for the perspective of planters, affordable supplies of labor, as well as assurance of freedom of movement and a limited amount of protection to laborers. Though the facade of an orderly, safe, and open system uh, for the movement of laborers, um, other than slavery, was at times simply on paper, Laborers were recruited initially under an agreement for five years, in most instances, after which laborers were recruited um, to either return uh, or settle in the colonies where they were taken. Many of the laborers would stay in the destination country beyond the five year uh, contracts, forming creolized societies, creolized uh, formations culturally and practically in various parts of the world. And recruitment, however, would continue. Um, and recruitment would happen through various systems. Um, and in Northern India, recruitment uh, in the late 19th century primarily happened through recruiters known as Arkatis, who had financial incentives to procure as many recruits as possible. And rec these recruiters would likely use at times false information about the location and nature of work and the scale of wages that they would offer to laborers. In Southern India, uh, there were pre-existing systems of recruitment that predated this system, uh, the Kangani and the Maestri system. Kangani in an anglicized form of a Tamil word referring to an overseer or a foreman. I mean, these systems developed alongside uh, indentured labor. So this is one site in which there is a pre-colonial um, practice. The system was based on a network of headmen or middlemen who recruited and supervised the laborers often through family networks. And by contrast with the indentured system, laborers in, in these networks were not bound by a contract, uh, but were brought under debt nets by advanced payments. It is important to fully uh, grasp this uh, broader context of the indentured labor system as the presence of it brought emigration law to India. And those um, changes were profound and lasting informing how immigration laws have evolved to the present day. Um, in addition to this context of migration, there are of course many others. And the four others that I list here are also a part of the modern world context. So there were also those uh, who pushed for the abolition of the system, uh, often um, those who were uh, attached at times 
um, to independent uh, sources of employment, and at times those who were a part of the British Empire. At times there were those who were a part of imperial service, including military soldiers, workers, guards, and policemen sent to various parts of the British Empire from the mid 19th century onward through the end of empire in the 1940s, various places in Southeast Asia, Singapore, British Malaya, then Burma, now uh, Myanmar. Another uh, is the world of students and educationists who in the modern world often overlapped with the next category of anti-colonial nationalists. Um, and those uh, individuals often, and I will speak about them later, traversed borders at numerous turns um, from the late 19th century onward in various parts of North America, Southeast Asia, and uh, in the early 20th century, often converged in Japan, um, as well as other places in the world. Um, and finally, the experience of laborers migrating to and from the Gulf, in particular around the turn of the century, of uh, the 20th century, intensifies in the immediate post-colonial period and uh, comprises a final grouping uh, for the purposes of historical analysis in a global historical context. Scattered throughout the 19th and 20th centuries also, one would find capitalists, one would find entrepreneurs in different forms. And from the middle of the 20th century, in the context of forced migration, because of the partition of colonial India, refugees as well, um, as another uh, site of social change vis-a-vis -vis migrations. All of these types of migrations would entail their own uh, sorts of investigations and uh, bring forth their own social histories. And rather than explore each and every one of them, I will rather discuss, uh, relative to the book that I am discussing today, recent methods used by scholars to discuss uh, migration in uh, global uh, history. So um, as covered in this uh, book, uh, that is uh, the cover which is pictured here, new research is focused on particularly three directions. One is labor history, another is biography, and another is legal history. And lots of debate about the nature of indentured labor, again, uh, a key uh, component of this book, um, exist in the literature. And earlier generations of scholars called this system a, quote, new system of slavery. And one uh, paper about this uh, chapter about this in the book uh, explores the end uh, of the system and shows how those who had fought to end the system uh, were often led by uh, elite so-called free Indians, those who were not um, indentured laborers, individuals like Mohandas Gandhi and others who wanted to cleanse the image of Indians abroad as free from the stains of indenture. And the treatment of free Indians, so-called, in South Africa provoked great anger in various circles in India, in part because of Gandhi's links to prominent Indian nationalists and publicity generated in India by his various campaigns uh, in South Africa against caste laws, uh, laws against residents for Indians and uh, marriages and other such issues. Um, Indian nationalists though had hoped that stopping the supply of indentured labor would reduce the overall Indian population in South Africa, uh, this is in the early 20th century, and change white policies toward Indians the treatment of the quote, free Indian population rather than that of indentured Indians is what initially prompted agitation against indenture. And an individual profiled in this one chapter in the book um, discusses one of Gandhi's uh, lieutenants, Pollock, um, who was very active on this question and spent a lot of time in 1909 and 1910 traveling in between India and South Africa gathering support for the end of uh, indenture and shows how the support was uh, developed because of the uh, plight of so-called free Indians. The idea was to make South Africa safe for so-called free Indians. And this is what was uh, discussed in 1911 and 1912. 
this chapter highlights a figure like Pollock, uh, who has been overlooked often in the historiography, and also uh, examines the nuanced reasons for various stakeholders to end indentured emigration to South Africa. As a reminder, uh, that system for South Africa begins in the 1860s and ends formally in 1911, uh, approximately 150,000 indentured laborers were sent there. Um, the white minority government uh, had arranged alternative African labor um, options in the 1910s and was pleased to end Indian labor migration um, in the 1910s. Indenture did not immediately end uh, following the 1912 tour that I mentioned of Pollock, um, who was close to Gandhi, uh, but rather because the South African state had found uh, sufficient labor uh, supplies in um, Southern Africa. And also another reason was the um, uh, imposition of wartime needs of the British Empire, which is often overlooked in the popular stories about indentures end, which is a new topic of uh, research in South Africa. Um, labor history also uh, focuses on um, issues uh, in this book, uh, such as contract, which is uh, a key feature of the history of indentured labor, as well as the rise of petitions that had um, become more and more visible uh, in the late 19th century in num numerous languages, and uh, as well as the notion and practice of consent. Um, these chapters about labor history focus on the transformative nature of this experience of indentured labor for the lives of migrants and the system of migrants vis-a-vis -vis contract, petition, and consent. Uh, one chapter in the book on this topic, uh, Ashutosh Kumar's Legal Discourses on Coolie Migration from India to the Sugar Colonies, 1837 to 1922, brings together a detailed study of regulations around food provisions and uh, the rise of petitions which many um, indentured uh, migrants submitted, which in his terms and his argument demonstrates a measure of freedom and possibility, however limited for indentured laborers in the context of an emergent legal change, that of the rise of contract and petition. Um, and another chapter on this topic uh, is by Andrea Wright, who uh, researches contract and freedom uh, in the context of in de, uh, laborers in Bahrain um, in the present day, but traces the focus that both Indian as well as those in Bahrain who regulate the migrants, migration of labor on consent. And she traces the origin of consent to the indentured labor system in the middle of the 19th century. And her work complements a broader history of modern migrations to the Persian Gulf which is not only uh, rig, uh, sorted around indentured labor, but has numerous other uh, manifestations. And this builds upon the many advances in Indian Ocean uh, histories of slavery and indenture from the work of Gwyn Campbell, Indrani Chatterjee, Richard Allen, uh, Claire Anderson, and other scholars. Um, biographies are also a source of new work, which is represented in this volume. Um, from the work of Gayatra Bahadur, whose 2013 book, Kuli Woman, offers a historical reflection on her great-grandmother, who was indentured and sent to Guyana, um, as well as her own, Gayatra, the writer, her own migrations from Guyana to the United States in the late 20th century, and the work of Samia Khatun, whose book, Australia Nama, analyzes how South Asians migrated to and became embedded in Australian society from the late 19th century. Both of those works are inspirations for the kind of biographical studies that are in this volume. Um, the chapters on this topic include studies of lesser known individuals who span the spectrum of the historical landscape, but appear in the history of the 19th and 20th centuries such as Tarak Dash, pictured here on the left, a globe-trotting uh, Indian uh, anti-colonial nationalist who studied in the United States in the early 20th century, 
He applied for citizenship in the United States in the era of Asian exclusion three times, and he received it in 1914. Um, and he worked for many different Indian nationalist causes in the United States and earned the first PhD from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service in 1925, after having written a PhD from the Library of Congress and spends most of his adult life in the era of Asian exclusion from the United States in the United States um, and uh, lives there uh, and uh, dies in 1958. Another fascinating figure included in this book is a, a chapter analyzing the work and life of uh, Pandurag Khankoje, who is pictured here in the middle. He is of the same generation uh, as Dash, uh, and he migrated to the United States also in the 1900s, the first decade of that century. He joined the Revolutionary Party, the other party there in California, and he studied in California. And then uh, during the Mexican Revolution, uh, found his way to Mexico because of contacts he had made in California who had uh, encouraged him to travel to Mexico. He then, uh, because of the revolution as well as different uh, uh, politics in Mexico at the time, um, he was unable to leave in the 1920s and stays there through the 1950s, working in different contexts uh, as a researcher in agriculture, and also taught at universities in Mexico during his time there, only to return to uh, India after the independence of India. Um, he lived his life on the global stage of the first half of the 20th century, and his political, professional, and family trajectories developed independently uh, from national or regional allegiances, yet he was devoted to the cause of uh, Indian nationalism and the desire to return to India, uh, which he does um, just after uh, independence of India. Um, and having done so at the end of his life, he felt uh, unappreciated and out of place in the country that he had longed for as a young man fleeing across the world, despite the recognition of Indian citizenship that came at the end of his life, which does uh, happen, the only non-colonial form of official identity by uh, Kankoje uh, that he held was that of a Mexican naturalized citizen, which is what he attains in the 1930s. And despite the political devotion that he had developed, he, he like Dash, was reared in um, specific nationalist circles in the early 20th century. He was uh, practically and experientially a Mexican citizen for most of his life. And this uncomfortable blend explains the minor role played by him in most accounts of the history of Indian nationalism and only a handful of mentions of him in the histories of the Gadar movement. This uh, chapter discusses these issues as well as the uh, absence from Mexican historiography, though the author of this chapter is a scholar based in Mexico and has access the uh, archival and other textual records about him in Spanish, of which there is quite a lot. Um, at the same time, while this absence is uh, somewhat understandable, he has also been excluded from many of the narratives of the history of the Indian diaspora in the 20th century, unlike uh, his uh, uh, colleagues and comrades, individuals like Aurobindo Ghosh, um, uh, Birendranath Chattopadhyay, uh, Gandhi, of course, and many others, um, he is often excluded from those histories as well. Um, the circumstances that allowed him to live and thrive off of the grid of these transcontinental uh, networks of control and exchange, that of Indian anti-colonial nationalism, um, surprisingly do not find him in these histories. But this book uh, aims to uh, adjust the gaze of these histories and input such people into those narratives. Finally, individuals like uh, Santamani Gavinder, pictured on the right in a family photo, um, is the subject of an entire chapter in this book. She was born in 1923 in the midst of racially segregated uh, colonial South Africa. She grew up in the apartheid system, which emerges from 1948 uh, onward. And at that time, South Africa, the state, 
was like many other states that that did this later in the 20th century, uh, aimed to deport those of Indian origin in uh, South Africa. Um, she was not uh, deported and she stayed there. Um, Indians uh, obtained citizenship in 1961. Uh, and this is also a time when South Africa was urbanizing. Um, and uh, this is a process that her, she witnessed throughout her life as she traces her origin to uh, indentured laborers uh, in her um, ancestry, one generation before her. But in her life, um, she was a part of the urbanization uh, of the city of Durban. And she and her family maintained life and work in South Africa during and after uh, apartheid is not only a child of indenture, but also of the South African social landscape and is inescapable from either of those histories. One scholar based in South Africa whose work is also in the book, um, Uma Lupelia Mestri has researched individuals whose histories of migration are very difficult to capture. One such individual um, whose name in the records uh, at times is Lachimin. Um, her life commences in 1832 in Raibareli um, in India and ends in 1911 uh, in Yamba on the Clarence River in the northern part of New South Wales in um, what is now Australia. So her life has been patched together from ship records and archives, which reveal her passage as an indentured woman. She was widowed at age 28, and she had three sons between the age of eight and four, and with those sons traveled to St. Vincent's in the West Indies in 1871 and returned to India on the expiry of her contract, followed by another indentured contract in Fiji, 1884. And this is another aspect of migration that was common in the context of indenture of re-migration. Um, and at that time, she was accompanied by a husband and 10 children. Her final passage took her to Sydney in 1890 as a widow and a free immigrant with eight children, where she created a new identity for herself, Elizabeth Phillips. And stories like this and of other families in Australia with indentured backgrounds occur in the British Empire at also parts of the French Empire, which as Margaret Allen argues, quote, demonstrate the global mobility and agency of Indians within the indentured labor scheme after they left indentured. They show histories of migration and re-migration, and they are made possible by the arduous searches of family members, often supplemented by the historian in multiple archives, across the globe. And through them, we learn also about the history of legal restrictions, an important element in Lachiman's biography as studied by Dubelia Mestri, is the ability to enter Australia, this is the late 19th century, as a quote, free immigrant before the passage of the Immigration Restriction Act of 1898 by New South Wales, which imposed a written test in a European language on all immigrants. And this act was superseded in 1901 when the newly established Federation of Australia in 1901 effectively excluded fresh Indian immigration by imposing a dictation test on would-be immigrants. This person, Lachiman slash Elizabeth Phillips, she was able to enter before that law was put into place. So now I'll focus on one of the subfields in this book, the, the third, um, that of legal history which finds a focus in this book by chapters uh, by uh, Riyadh Koya on the end of indenture and Marina Martin on the legal categorizations of Indian migrants in South Africa. Legal history shows a discussion of how emigration out of India was regulated from 1834, the moment of transatlantic slavery's abolition through the 1983 Emigration Act uh, in independent India. And a series of legal acts were brought in the 1830s to regulate emigration from Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay. Uh, and they covered terms of contract, uh, a means of transport, and the need to return migrants at the end of service. And this is where, in the context of this book, the history of migrations from that perspective of the regulation of migrants from India, uh, that is where this begins. 
It would be the first intrusion uh, and management of the state in terms of regulating the movement of people in this form. Um, though, of course, as many scholars have studied, there is widespread migration as a fact before this moment. But this is the moment that there is an official record of how the company and then British Empire and then Indian state will regulate um, movement. In the following years, official reports of the appalling conditions of migrants resulted in more labor um, uh, regulation and attention to recruitment practices and the terms of indentured contractual arrangements to regulate the indentured system and for the British authorities of India to ensure the well-being of immigrants to other colonies, a law commission was named and delivered a report leading to the Act Number no. 7 of 1837, which gave the Indian state the authorities to supervise labor contracts and to grant permission, 1837, to grant permission to emigrate. The government of the East India Company banned emigration in 1838 because there were reports of repression and abuse. In 1842, the then British Prime Minister Peel directed the British Indian government to reopen uh, lines of immigration. And a protector, this is 1842, protector of Indian immigrants was appointed to ensure that laborers had adequate space, food and uh, water on the journey. From the 1840s, uh, not only the protector, but other positions were created that exist in some form today in the independent state of India, such as medical workers, recruitment agents, and magistrates, at that time deputed solely for the purpose of regulating immigration. The 1883 Act <clears throat> continued uh, to mention uh, protectors and agents but kept a distinction that would last until 1983, and this is discussed in one chapter in this book by Riyad Koya, a distinction between land and sea. And only those who emigrated by sea were to be regulated in this form, were to be monitored in this form. Um, rise of companies based in colonial India, but deploying workers in what is now called the Middle East, um, starts to emerge after that act. None of the regions conquered by the British Empire in uh, what is now the Middle East were listed in that 1883 act. And so Indian companies began to lobby, companies based in India, lobby to send laborers there underneath the aegis of the Indian Emigration Act. Um, as petroleum interests uh, based in India and throughout British imperial sites pushed for more laborers, this is in the 1890s and 1900s, emigration then became authorized from Karachi uh, to the Gulf in 1904. And this is something that is another departure. This is not the case in the earlier period. Delayed because of the Great War, but in motion since the 1910s, as I have mentioned earlier, was a push to end the indentured labor system. And the system began to crack uh, from the 1911 moment when uh, labor stopped flowing to South Africa and then all added up uh, to the 1922 Indian Immigration Act, which uh, ends formally uh, indentured labor. And mentions that it abolishes labor for hire. This is how it is uh, written in this law, but only so-called unskilled labor. This is 1922, which at that time uh, referred to agricultural labor. Um, however, those who were seen as performing skilled labor uh, in the law, it mentions artisans, clerks, and those who worked in education, they are not uh, to be affected by immigration restrictions. The 1922 Act as Riyad Koya in this book analyzes, recalibrated the border between land and sea. So how did that work? The apparatus of recruitment was decommissioned. So approximately a century of uh, bureaucratic apparatus was created. This was um, stopped. And the office of the immigration agent, immigration depots, licensing of recruiters, these were eliminated. 
the scope of regulation was enhanced to encompass both skilled and unskilled. Unskilled was defined simply as engaging in agriculture. Skilled, formerly defined by, as departure by sea for certain purposes, included now, as of 1922, clerks and shop assistants. In the enhanced regulation of skilled labor under the 1922 Act, earlier exemptions were transmuted into new chapters, outlining distinctive procedures for state regulation. Indian immigration law uh, continued to divide and multiply labor, skilled and unskilled, relying on the category of skill while continuing to permit labor emigration within the Indian Ocean world, though after World War I, an exemption was articulated for military labor. This act survived independence and the patterns of migration during the decolonization era of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Migrants in this era were not seen as a part of Indian state's purview, as declared by uh, then Prime Minister Nehru in 1952, an Indian government report instructed all diplomatic missions uh, abroad that the quote, first objective in regard to the Indian overseas communities should be help to help them assimilate to local conditions and to identify as closely as possible with the interests of the quote, indigenous population. And this is 1952. Because of an increase in abuse of migrants in the 1950s to 1970s period, in the Gulf, the Indian state revised this law in 1983 after approximately 30 years of, over 30 years of independence in which these laws were in place. Um, they were updated to reflect the new geopolitical world order, the new um, presence of and demand for laborers to the Gulf in various parts of the world after decolonization. An aspect of the act in 1983 states that it defines emigration as the quote, departure out of India of any person with a view to taking up any employment, whether or not under an agreement or other arrangements to take up such employment and whether with or without the existence of a recruit, recruiting agent or employer in any country or place uh, outside India. The act uh, focuses on so-called economic migrants leaves out a large number of migrants in other categories, family members, dependents, uh, and others. Based around this definition, and in order to protect the most vulnerable at the destination countries, the Indian government created separate policies of immigration for skilled and unskilled. Um, this is another facet of history that is uh, derived from the history of indentured labor. Um, those who intend to migrate to the United Arab Emirates, to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, Bahrain, um, and other places, Malaysia as well, and, and others in Southeast Asia, with an educational qualification below class 10, are required to get an immigration clearance. And this is one part of the broader continuity of the presence of protectors um, and agents that we see from the indentured period. The origins of this are in late imperial India and in the end of indenture. Um, regarding changes, we find uh, that the routes of capital and labor stuck to British imperial lanes uh, in great, uh, in, in, in majority of cases from the 1830s to the 1920s, but shifted on to more um, intensified linkages to the Gulf afterwards. Um, in particular, in the context of decolonization, this is also a time when the United States of America became a more prominent global geopolitical actor, as it did in the history of educational exchanges and linkages between India uh, from the mid 20th century onward. However, there are always aspects of the earlier time periods and relationships that appear in uh, the present. So many of the individuals who are profiled in the work, like Tarek Nabdash and like um, uh, Kankoje and many others, had very specific relationships to the United States, both literally and in terms of the educational experiences they had, and in terms of the symbolic importance of the United States as it represented to them 
a, um, a liberal democratic uh, state. Um, also distinctions of unskilled and skilled from 1983 stayed, um, but they were defined in 1983 uh, as the unskilled so-called as both agricultural and industrial uh, labor. Um, and this is something that is new to that moment. In the 1970s and 80s, other countries outside of India also changed their immigration acts around the same time, Pakistan, and then after 1971, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka from the end of the 1970s also started to use the same kind of approach to the uh, regulation of uh, migrants. And this means, however, that in the 1950s to the 1970s, the time of the creation of Bangladesh and the time of a reorientation of the global uh, system, uh, the older policies from the end of indenture uh, were maintained. So the significance of South Asian migrations in a global historical context, which is where I will end uh, this presentation, lies in the way the Indian state both drew from and retained the, uh, the importance of the facts of so many migrants living, uh, working, and charting lives outside of India that had important effects in host societies as well as to India. About the effects on host societies, the research that is in this book shows uh, different la layers of engagements with various societies after the periods of indenture or formal migration had ended. These effects are seen through the profiles of individuals I have mentioned earlier, uh, such as Tarak Nath Dash, Pandura Kankoje, or um, Santamani Gavinder, um, through a method of uh, historical biography, without a sense of the history of such migrations or the legal history of migrations, it would be impossible to fully grasp how the Indian state has changed, in particular since the 1990s period onward, when the various moves toward changing citizenship rules uh, for those abroad have started to change. And this is a reference to the overseas citizen of India uh, category. The symbolic register of migrants have changed in a global context. If we compare the times of Nehru and the rejection of uh, those so-called colonial born Indians to the times of Modi and the 21st century, the legal apparatus through which migrants are examined, protected, and their lives are managed by state forces owe at the same, in the same way the origins to the late imperial period. Um, of the 1910s and 1920s. And future scholars of migrations should focus on how the changes of that time continue to focus, uh, to inform migration policies, patterns, and politics in the present day. And I will stop uh, speaking here and thank all of you for your time uh, and attention. Um, thank you, Nilesh. It looks like CSH uh, meeting room will just take a minute to get in. Um, oh, right. oh. Oh, sorry, I, I was speaking. Uh, I didn't realize I was still muted. Uh, yeah, you're you're hearing. Are, are you are you hearing me? Yes. Oh, yes. Everything's fine. Everything's fine, John. Uh, uh, so I was just uh, thanking uh, Professor Nilesh Bose for this. Uh, uh, for this vivid and global uh, uh, presentation of this large scope and uh, and comparison, so uh, I'm sure that there would be uh, there would be uh, really important insights from the uh, from the audience uh, and questions and also questions in the chat box. So those who uh, are too shy to ask a question in the in person can can put their question down. Uh, otherwise, they can raise their hand on the participant uh, 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 forum, and I will I will take their questions. Uh, I'm sure that uh, maybe uh, Aprajita, you you. Um, Christoph has a question. He Christoph just... has a question. Right, right. Christoph, would you like to to step in by muting yourself? Um, yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, Thanks to uh, Professor Bogues for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, 
Uh, I have a question. Uh, since you've really uh, focused on uh, migration as if it was completely state regulated, uh, which it was to a large extent compared to Chinese out migration, uh, what was the space given to individual uh, uh, Indian entrepreneurs and business people? I mean, we know of, of course, some uh, merchant communities, but so many, in fact, individuals uh, managed to, uh, to, to go from, I mean, it can be South Africa, but it can be, of course, Singapore, Myanmar. And um, how do they fit uh, the state narrative of uh, regulated uh, migration from the early uh, 19th century? Because we don't have so much on these uh, flows. And I think economically, uh, politically, may not be demographically, they were quite important. Even if in terms of proportion, of course, uh, they were less common than among uh, the Chinese uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, yes, thank you very much um, uh, for your question and for your uh engagement with this topic, I would say that it is very true that merchants uh, constitute a very strong uh, and significant element of the migrants and migrations uh, from India from the early 19th century to the present. What ha one reason why I did not focus on them as such is both because um, there is a tendency in many of the literatures uh, in Eastern Africa and in Southern Africa and in North America and in the Middle East to see those individuals as somehow uh, not a, a part of those societies, a part of these societies in which people, uh, where people had migrated. And so therefore, the, the way that they have been studied often is either through only themselves as merchants and only through the flows of capital or through their relationship to India. Now, that is not at all uh, the case when we delve into certain family histories. Um, and there is a um, uh, important set of uh, studies on particular families. But the um, ability to place such uh, entities into these sorts of uh, contexts is a challenge. It is a challenge to us um, as historians. Uh, and so, because they don't, they don't appear vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state in this form, and often they are, uh, in a sense, enabled by the colonial state forces as opposed to regulated or monitored. So therefore, they are some degree outside of our scope. And our goal in this volume was to draw attention to those uh, individuals and to those formations that had um, a lasting presence in host societies and to think about how uh, those, th that kind of a presence made an impact uh, and to then possibly reframe uh, narratives of migration that way. Now, there is though, uh, there are studies uh, of certain merchants and, and families, and I would say that uh, that may be perhaps the next uh, kind of work that sh must happen um, that would follow uh, this sort of endeavor of this edited volume. Um, and there are, there are such works on specifics. Uh, East Africa, for example, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, research on, on that topic. Um, and in so Southeast Asia, as you mentioned, in Singapore, uh, and also what is now Indonesia and what is now Myanmar, some of these networks are still uh, in existence. But again, because of their lack of, uh, lack of um, presence in terms of the state, uh, you know, uh, state uh, documentation and, and monitoring, and because of how the families often are resistant um, to being placed uh, into these historical networks is another reason why they don't appear. It is not because we are not aware of them. I mean, they're very important, but, but because the historiographical um, impulses were in different areas. But I, I agree very much that they are very important and they perhaps should be the subject of, of more uh, concentrated future studies um, in this uh, context. I believe there's another question by Bruno Doren. Uh, I would invite that question or others. Yeah, yeah. Yes, of course, uh, Bruno, would you like, would yeah. you like to ask your question? Uh, uh, sorry again, but I have a power cut 
for work at home, so I won't show my face. Um, thank you, Professor Bose, for this uh, for this lecture. It's a very good advertisement for your book. I'm not at all myself an historian nor a geographer. I'm a macroeconomist and uh, focused on ag employment, agriculture, land, uh, and uh, food issue uh, over decades. And I have two questions here, simple question, please excuse uh, in advance, forgive me in advance. But the first one, it seems after hearing you that uh, all in all, uh, emigration from India was a rather marginal uh, emigration. I, I, I say that when I compare to the West European, for instance, who migrate to the Americas between uh, 1850 and First World War, you know, there were about uh, 40 million American, uh, according to Atten and Williams, some uh, estimates. And, uh, and uh, you quote very, very little figure in your, in, in your lecture, but uh, it seems uh, compared to the overall population, uh, India is not really, uh, uh, what could I say, a, a land of emigration, emigration right? Uh, I would like you to confirm this if you have, if you can, I don't know if you, can, if you have some, some, if you can quote some figures compared to the total population and comparing to, to other figures uh, from other part of the world. This is my first question. My second question is uh, uh, sometimes I always wonder, you know, uh, during my first day in India for my PhD field survey, I had a maid, an old maid, uh, wh whose parents was uh, in Ahmedabad. Uh, it was in the end, end of the 90s, uh, night, no, end of the 80s, sorry, 1991. And uh, she, she told me I, I wanted to write a, a bi biography, but I never did it, unfortunately. But she had a very uh, amazing uh, life. And her parents or grandparents, I don't, I don't remember, were African, uh, were coming from African and uh, coming from Gujarat, if I remember, et cetera. So uh, uh, can you say more about this uh, African to India uh, during the first, uh, I don't know when it happened, but was it large and uh, why it happened uh, during the early uh, 20th centuries? If you can say more on that, if it's uh, just also a marginal or uh, an elliptical or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bruno Doren, for the question. Um, and uh, I will take both of these questions. They're both important questions, and I thank you for raising them. Now, the point about emigration and whether or not it is marginal uh, in the context of India, uh, I uh, would uh, advertise and hope that uh, those uh, watching can acquire this book, uh, perhaps, and there are many other uh, good works that show that the framework uh, in which migration was understood that leads to your figure, uh, 1850s to World War I, in which European migrants coming primarily to North and South America was a very significant migration, is seen from the perspective of North America and from Europe. But if we see from the perspective of the Indian Ocean, and this is something that is uh, studied by the uh, scholar Sunil Amrit, uh, who has a book that discusses this point, mentions that there is more migration in the Indian Ocean itself, but not at that time period, but after World War I. So for most of the histories uh, that we know for the European context, World War I leads to a very big decline in migration. Uh, and so World War I and the Great Depression and World War II, there is not as much migration, but there is quite a lot happening in Indian Ocean. We do not know the exact numbers, and it is very difficult for us to have a handle on that because of the lack of full uh, archival information. But I would say that it is a dense uh, and not a marginal, but a quite a significant element of the history of India and of South Asia from World War I through the end uh, of empires in the late 1940s of migration within uh, India to places such as Ceylon, to what was uh, British Malaya um, and the Strait Settlements. Um, and those migrations increase 
And another element that is that changes the view from Europe is that there's a lot of migration, speaking back to the point of merchants, uh, that is circular and that does not lend itself easily to counting uh, one person moving from one place and then staying in another. And so if we don't see it through Europe and we don't see it through uh, migration and settlement, but through circular movement, then we find that migration from India becomes much more significant than only being a um, marginal element uh, of history. Another point uh, is the point of the relationship of Africa to India. And I will simply uh, say, uh, I have another um, piece I would like to advertise. It is coming out later this year about this very topic. Um, and so there are a few uh, processes that lead to the presence of people of African origin in India. The numbers, again, is difficult to know because we don't have archival uh, sources, but we have a lot of other moments in history that we know of. So we know of uh, one particular person, uh, Malik of Amber, who is a person who integrated into India and became a, a specific element uh, of medieval and early modern Indian politics and rose to a position of visibility uh, and was an opponent of the Mughal Empire, somebody whose origins were in Africa. And most likely, uh, there are descendants of this person in different parts of West uh, and Southwestern India. And we know from other pockets of India in uh, the history of Bengal, we know that there was a brief period when there was a ruling family that it take, took power briefly. And their origins also were in slave cultures that had risen to power in different parts of India, uh, again, in early modern India. And the descendants of such people we know exist in contemporary South Asia. And there would be other similar movements of people, uh, primarily through Western India, who show this relationship. So early modern migrants into Western and Northern India who have their origins in Africa, who mixed with populations in India, this is another facet of the relationship of India to the rest of the world that is often not studied um, in, in great detail and shows its relationship to the outside, not so much Indian migrants elsewhere, but how connected India uh, has been to the rest of the world. It is also the subject of uh, different kinds of research, research in material culture, research in anthropology, and research in cultural practices that can be traced to these, um, these migrations and to this person. The person I mentioned, Malik of Ambar, has a historiography, there's a biography of him, and there are depictions, uh, visual depictions of him. So we know different aspects of history from that um, vantage point, and I would be happy to continue this uh, later. Uh, there are more details that can be said about it, uh, but we know that there is, uh, there is significance and density to migration outside only the numbers. Uh, and the numbers we know much more of in the European and Atlantic context, but we know that there is a lot of significance placed onto migration in India and in the Indian Ocean. I think the next question is Ayan Mir. Right, Ayan Mir, would you like to ask your question? And after uh, Junia Levek will also ask your question, maybe after Professor uh, Nilesh Bose answers to uh, Ayan's question. Yes, thank you, Professor Bose. I'm not putting my camera because my internet connection is, is quite limited. I apologize for that. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, the first one is, is methodological uh, on the labor side of your global history. Um, I'm, I'm relating to the methodological approach that people like Marcel van der Linden have been promoting of global labor history and how do you, in your work discussing labor, you articulate this idea of a, a global working class as wide as possible, so not just a traditional working class, with once the, you know, post-independence, the emergence, or even before, for, of a more traditional labor movement in South Asia, and how this movement articulates with the more expansive definition of the working class, and how, like, how methodologically, as, he, as a historian, do you articulate perhaps the tension that exists between these two representations of what a working class is or what labor represents. The other question I had is just really, I, I was wondering if you could, if you had a few references to recommend regarding the intellectual history 
of emigration in South Asia. I, I asked this question because I came across this text by Radha Kamal Mukherjee from 1936 called Migrant Asia, in which he argues that uh, it was actually reviewed by Robert Park and the American Journal of Sociology at the time, and in which he argues that you know, the world should share, like places of surplus population like the subcontinent should be able to send people all over the world and to sort of like in a very organicist representation of the world. And that's, that interested me because in some sense, usually nationalist movements, or at least in the common sense, are quite against emigration because emigration in some sense means that there is less, you know, strength amongst people to fight for you know, a new nation or, or nationalist movement in that sense. And so I was curious to see if you were familiar with that or if there were some other in intellectual history references that you may recommend if I wanted to explore more this question. And, and finally, last question I wanted to ask if the book would be available in India anytime soon or if you know about that. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ayan Mir, for this question. Uh, three questions. Uh, first, I will say yes, the book should be available, and I, uh, with apologies for the extraordinary price of the book, but it is going to be available very soon in India, and I think it is now available online, and um, I believe it is now accessible. Um, and uh, about question one about methods of labor history, yes. So that is a very important point, and the book engages with a discussion of this briefly in its introduction by referencing Van Linden and also Prabhu uh, Mohapatra. And there, the discussion for this context is how important the history of indentured labor had been on two uh, registers, one for the International Labor Organization, and there is a claim that the presence of indentured laborers vis-a-vis -vis their treatment had spurred on uh, the recognition of labor as a category. And it is from partially from that angle that the study of indentured labor is undertaken in this volume, which is also on top of many different studies of indentured labor um, globally. Uh, so not only these studies that are here. The other point that is relevant, I think, is that the uh, focus in this book is on how certain aspects of uh, labor history that cross with legal history, such as the presence of contract and the presence of petition in the history of the working class as a part of labor history, is seen as visible within the history of indentured labor, and that this part of the history of indentured labor is often ignored or missed by those who do labor history elsewhere. And so this is something that is explored to some degree uh, in the work and is something that I, I um, look forward to more uh, engagement with on your and, and other uh, uh, parts. So, and, and finally about the intellectual history of immigration, uh, this is a very important uh, question uh, and a very important issue. And though it was not the focus as such of the work, I, I have encountered uh, a few texts, and I can send you the references later, of individuals in the orbit of those studied in this book. So Tarek Nadash for one, um, and uh, a few of the people he was in contact with, who make the argument that migrants are, uh, for the betterment of the places that they go to, and he is making this argument in the context of uh, 1920s uh, North America. But he cites uh, the prevailing studies of race science about the interaction of different peoples. And he is arguing that individuals who migrate um, are doing so for the betterment of the societies where they settle. And this is something that he does uh, pursue to some degree and he cites uh, the prevailing literature at that time. This is in the 1920s. And this is a point that is discussed briefly in this book, the edited volume. And this is a very important uh, issue in the history of migration and, uh, and in the context of the contemporary um, understanding of migration today, uh, globally. I would say that that issue has not been researched uh, quite directly in the context of South Asian uh, migration histories.
and also uh, deserves more um, and more direct um, study. So those are my um, answers. And again, I'd be very happy to uh, correspond in the future about the reference and about uh, these issues. Thank you. Thank you for this, this answer. Julien Levesque was in the room uh, uh, here at the CSH. Could maybe ask you uh, a question is on, you speak on the mic, but you see him on another camera. Yes. Uh, Julien Levesque, I'm a researcher here at CSH. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. I was just uh, wondering, you mentioned at some point how um, uh, recruiting officers, her recruitment largely happened through intermediaries and how these positions were also regulated. And I was wondering if you could, uh, if you've explored also that side of, of the picture and if you know more a bit about the social world of these people, how they ended up working uh, for the company and later the colonial states and uh, sending um, uh, their fellow uh, uh, I mean, their, their neighbors uh, to uh, abroad. And uh, also I was wondering to what extent these type of, of recruitment uh, happened along uh, caste lines or you know, to what extent uh, communities played a role in this. Thank you. Yeah, th yes, thank you very much uh, for that question. A very important point. Um, it, it is covered slightly in this work and I would, there, there are, uh, two major works, one by a German scholar and another by an Indian scholar about this topic in um, the context of South India and migrations to different parts of Southeast Asia, where the prevailing uh, consensus is that there were pre-colonial um, practices that relied on pre-existing caste networks, whereas uh, one uh, chapter in this book argues that the presence of indentured labor uh, officials, so there were protectors and there were agents. The argument in this book by one chapter is that those um, introduced a new um, element to recruitment, one that would monitor and not rely so much on caste networks, but uh, uh, exploit pre-existing uh, socioeconomic problems or changes, small scale uh, issues of food insecurity, issues of, of famine, um, at times vis-a-vis -vis war, um, those were the those were the factors as opposed to the caste networks. There and the end, there is a social history again between South India and Southeast Asia of these networks being uh, to some degree maintained by both the company and the British Empire. In the case of Ceylon, what is now Sri Lanka, and the Strait Settlements, uh, the literature on this topic. There's a new book on um, Malaya um, that has just come out about female laborers. Um, which also uh, addresses this question. Uh, and though it is not at, at the center of uh, this book that I have talked about, it is a feature of the field and it is something that also uh, compels uh, future research, which has to be done also outside only archival um, sources and would uh, necessarily engage with um, social histories, family histories and, and histories um, of uh, caste and caste groupings. And so that would be the broad um, answer. And I would suggest, again, I can be in touch about suggesting some of the specific uh, works that do engage with this topic. Thank you. Uh, Shabari Nair uh, would like to, to uh, ask you a question. Thanks so much, John Thomas. Uh, Nilesh, hi. hi, good morning. Uh, well, good afternoon from morning. Delhi, India. My name is Shabri Nair. I'm the Regional Migration Specialist for South Asia for the International Labour Organization. So let's just Great. say in so many different Great. ways, a lot of what you have said and a lot of the questions that have been asked nicely converge into the points that I've been thinking Great. about with regards to your own book. Um, I don't have many questions, Nilesh. I think, I think what I wanted to do was more or less uh, look at some of the elements that we could focus on stronger. I'm a policy guy, I'm not a historian, not an economist. Uh, and I try to look at how all these issues necessarily link in with the government of India's thinking. Uh, as, uh, as an individual entity or as a country that sends migrant workers uh, around the world, India is the largest migrant sending country in the world. 
uh, 18.5 million migrants uh, and almost all of them being migrant workers, right? So this is, this is a perfect coming together of migration and labor associated to that migration, you know, people who are migrating for work. I think, uh, you know, one of the things, Nilesh, and, I, and this is what I appreciated about your background into how we got to the 1983 Immigration Act is to keep in mind the fact that uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know how it came about. So I actually learned something uh, in terms of the origins and the history uh, of the 83 Immigration Act. Uh, what would also be good, Nilesh, is for us to explore much perhaps and, and going on to not to necessarily uh, talk about the scope of your current, of, of the book that you're publishing now, but going forward is how did this act come about vis-a-vis -vis India's relations with what, you know, India's foreign policy is based on the neighborhood policy. Uh, and then going forward from there, how did this come about with regards to India's relationship with the extended neighborhood? And that's the Gulf states. This is really where the 1983 Immigration Act comes to life. So I think, I think that corridor between India slash South Asia and the Middle East is the corridor that will give answers to a lot of the conversations to the origins of the 83 Immigration Act. And that's to linking it to the question that came from the CSH meeting room itself about recruiters, for instance. Uh, this goes into uh, the, 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 that traditional linkage across this corridor between South Asia and the Middle East. Uh, that brings me to South Asia as a whole. 83 was the Emigration Act, and 1985 was when SARC was established, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, comprising of eight member states in the subcontinent. There was no mention of migration. And it was only in 2014 when Nepal took over as uh, chair of the SARC did migration actually figure almost 30 years later for the first time in the SARC agenda. So what was that gap necessary as to why migration never figured in the SARC agenda? And the reason for that is the politics of the region. No matter how much you bring in labor and economics, if you leave out the politics, you will never get a full picture, right? You know, when ASEAN, ASEAN has always spoken about migration. Uh, in fact, in ASEAN, there is a whole conversation on intra-ASEAN mobility, movement within the ASEAN region. You know how every time ASEAN leaders stand together and take that final group photo, they hold hands like that, right? The funny thing is, in the context of South Asia, if the Indian and the Pakistani prime ministers decide to shake hands, that becomes headlines. The reason I mention this is because that is the politics in terms of why migration never figured in the South Asian, official South Asian agendas within SARC conversations. Also, let us not look at India as a singular entity. India is literally the sum of its parts. I think to an extent, Nilesh, you alluded to that when you just now referred to the movement from South India to Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore as an example. I originally come from Kerala in the south of the country. And the way migrant workers have moved from the south of India and predominantly from states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu is very different to how migrant workers have moved from Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and the other North Indian states. I think it's therefore important for us to dissect um, the, the history as also based on the kind of regions that they have come from. Otherwise, trying to draw a pan-Indian picture will not serve justice, I feel, um, to the history of migration in the context of India. And my last point is with regards to the governance of migration. Now, when you spoke about the Immigration Act, in fact, because you spoke about the history, I, I started wondering out loud, which was the ministry that was responsible to oversee the implementation of that act at the time in 1983? Because 
later on in the early 2000s when it when prime minister manmohan singh it was under his government they established a ministry of overseas indian affairs in 2016 that ministry was collapsed into the overseas indian affairs department within the ministry of external affairs so migration is seen as a foreign policy issue for india it's less of a labor issue it's less of an overseas indian affairs issue it's less of a development issue and more of a foreign policy issue so let's then also look into the history of how foreign policy has developed as far as india is concerned uh, because that i think will help us connect the dots but nilesh great work and all the best and i hope we can stay in touch and thanks to csh csh for organizing this thanks so much thank you so much uh, and i uh, just want to say a few things and uh, very glad to uh, have met you and i hope we can stay in touch you've given me also very good reminders for some future work that i would like to do um i just want to emphasize and repeat as you did and enhance the point that the importance of the shift in a way to the gulf as i mentioned and as you mentioned is really the the major context for the 1983 uh immigration act which means that and speaking to another point as you made about region is that india cannot be seen only in one uh gaze it's very diversified in terms of region um it is also uh in history historical terms cannot be seen in one spatial uh, framework yet the legal history um is something that we must attend to across uh, time and space if even the the places to which india is positioning itself of course changes and that change to the gulf um it begins in the late 19th early 20th century but then really becomes much more important uh, in the immediate post colonial period and another point that you made that is very important that i also believe and that is somewhat in this book uh is that migration though very important as you mentioned uh, and as i mentioned the largest um uh the country with the largest number of migrants and primarily uh laborers is india but not understood this way by india so there there has to be both uh, a critical understanding of this as well as an attention to the empirical record uh and this is why the history of migration is that much more important and then finally about the policy